Max Gorn, welcome to the Dusty Allen Show. I've been really excited to jump on. Um, obviously, heard great things, Dust. Mate, I'm I'm stoked to have you here. It's been a long time coming. You know, we battled around the pandemic, and I think like I've, I often don't like to talk about things that are potentially time sensitive on here, but I feel like this has gone on forever and has no sort of you know end in sight. And you know, we were able to find. An amazing space here at the Backlocked Studios, socially distant as well. I think we can that... talk about COVID as if it's a real thing now. I, I, yeah, I reckon like... safely when this podcast comes out, everyone will know what COVID is. Yeah, and it's probably best that it's sort of waited because there could have been speculation yeah. you know, if we'd done it like six months ago and yeah. like either of us might have been uh, been looking wrong. But how are you going? Uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, again, time sensitive, but we're just out from the season is when we are recording yes. this. Uh, and that is usually peak time of athlete mode. Like, I'm feeling the best I've felt. I've been in the sun for three months training. Um, I've as lean as I am normally for the whole year right now. So you feel pretty good. Um, add that for four month old. Um, yeah, to and coming off being the best last year. It's you um, can say that it's been a relatively good preseason. Is it similar to trying to equate to like your, your normal? your nine to five job where most people will take off, you know, you, you get your, a bit of December and a bit of January off and, you know, school holidays or that sort of stuff. Do you get a similar vibe of like where it's like back into the office? Is that, is that December for you? Like once the season's done or is it normally like new year? You're like, okay, now we're, we're back to work. It's obviously quirkier compared to other op- mm. op- occupations. For example, TGIF is just not a thing for footballers. <laughs> Because usually Saturdays is like game day. Yep. So we never have that Friday sensation of finishing yeah. work. And in pre-seasons, we train Saturdays as well. Um, but the December 6 it was this year was return to training. And that that's a similar feel to first day of school. That's like you're nervous. I've been at the same club for 13 years. I've walked through the same walls. I'm the oldest person there, longest on list. Like I know what I'm coming into. Yep. And I still walk in with nerves. I haven't seen guys for two months. Time trials, skin folds. Um, which is I don't think you guys do uh, at your work. Do you do no, skin folds? No, not, not skinny upon, upon arrival. No, I think skin folds is a is a is it a bit of a taboo subject these days? Like it's to... uh, it can be associated with mental health. Yep. Um, like fat shaming. Fat in a shaming. Way. Yep. Um, and even now at a place that probably the only sport that maybe does it, or the definitely uh, in terms of gender, I don't think the AFLW girls do it. Yep. Um, or they might do it behind closed doors, but even the men are getting behind closed doors now. Mm. So it's not just everyone in one room and we all cheer if it's a big result like, yeah. and get into the person. <laughs> so that's changed. Since yeah. I first got to the club, it was like everyone get in the room and we'll parade around in skin folds and, yeah. and everyone have a watch. Now it's like behind closed doors, talk it through with your dietitian. Um, you don't have to be under a certain level. Like for years, it's been like baby boomer coaches want you under 50. Like blanket approach, blanket no matter approach, who you are. under fifty, yeah. no matter who who you are, and there's people that just have never been under fifty the whole life, but they're yeah. the best player in the team. Yeah. So there's at some point there's got to be something. Okay, maybe you're fifty five, and that's what it's come to. So now it's like a bit more tailored. Um, they're slowly on their way out because there's this new test called DEXA scans, which everyone is all about, and not the ones where you just at the supermarket where you stand on, you pay a dollar and you stand and it on gets, it, gives tells you BMI you. and stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not that. Uh, you actually lie down and it goes through your whole body. Uh, it gives you lean fat mass and all that, and that's a little bit more high tech than just your calipers on the guts. And is it still? Is it something that's that people, players, athletes are concerned about? Like whatever method it is, whether it's skin folds, whether it's the the DEXA scan. Like if you, but do you generally have a good? Let's say you've had the worst preseason you could you could have. You've overindulged with food, you know, um, wine, whatever. What would a change be? And let's say like a hypothetical number that to come back in from your best where you'd be like really concerned. Uh, to answer the first part, I still have mad anxiety around mm. day one. Yeah. And time trial a little bit more, but skin folds definitely. Skin folds have, for me, they don't change very often. Yep. If I do have that bad month where I'm having pavlova every night, yep. I could potentially go up one or two. Um, so like from like a 45 to a 47. Yeah where like someone who is a little bit worse off than me in the genetic side might go from like a 40 to a 70 after a bad like three months on the piss or something yep. like that. So I'm not as nervous for that, but time trial, yeah. 
How do you? And I like running, but I just get nervous about performing in running. I think nerves are a good thing. Yeah. Because if you roll in like, oh, I've got this. You know, and and I've been, I've got to be careful there because I said anxiety and then I've said nerves. There is yeah. a difference. I feel like anxiety for me is if I'm thinking about it for three weeks leading mm. into it and it's completely controlled my life, um, which I don't think I've got to that level. Um, but definitely nerves. Definitely the night before. Butterflies? Yeah, butterflies. Yeah. Talk about it all. You rock up at Casey at 7 a.m. The time trial's at 10. I've talked about it with everyone for that three hours, my race plan, my everything. Um, I mean, that completely goes out the window a minute into the time trial when I'm yeah. absolutely cooked. Um, but yeah, there is a difference. So I just wanted to... Do you all go at the same time? No, uh, in the famous 3K time trials we do, but it's four ones, four 1Ks now. Um, so it's a little bit too tight and you've got to try and get everyone's numbers and everyone's time and we all sort of finish around closer together rather than a three one uh when it's a three K there's a two minute gap between first and last so it's a little bit easier to control. Yeah. Um so we go off in groups. Who's in your group? Like who are you know, year in, year out, who are you making sure you wanna wanna beat? Just purely for fun. So I'm slightly different because I'm a ruck. Yep. Um and there's only three of us and the young our young guy's quite fit, Luke. Um and Mad Jack's probably on the other end. So I'm in the middle of those three, but not, we don't run together because there's no point. Um, so I'm sort of in the in our midfield group. I'm in the middle. So we've got some really good midfielders, and then we've got a couple of guys in the middle, then a couple of guys at the back. I won't go into names, but yep. um, I'd be somewhere around the middle in the midfield group. So I'd, I'd, I'd normally run with Track, Clayton, Jack Viney. Yep. Although Jack Viney's flying this preseason. And is it, it's all busy. There's no chatting, no banter whilst you're running. Like once you're there, it's just go. And... I hate. And our mutual friend, uh, Adam Tomlinson, um, he loves to talk while he runs. And if we're holding like four minute 30 pace, which is very comfortable for him, yeah. he'll look down on his watch and go, oh, geez, we're not going very quick. Like he'll say I, stuff I, I like that. I think Tomo's physically incapable of running slower than 430. <laughs> yeah. He's just like, you know, that's what you're going to get. And he uh, and he'll he could talk the whole time. Yeah. You know? And yeah, I feel like I have my moments where I'm like flying and then I'll, I'll disappear. So but, he, does, he does the old, if you're halfway in and if you're at a minute, 30 that's when you're going okay if you're at minute 40 you got to speed up if you're at a minute 25 you can slow down i'm like if i cross that line a halfway and i'm a minute 40 i can't speed up that's just telling that's just letting redlining. me know that my result's going to be bad before it's bad <laughs> there's no speeding up i've got that one pace the whole way now mate it's been a year for you you know personally professionally you've you've scaled the you've hit, hit the pinnacle of of your sport uh, winning the the AFL Premiership as captain, you know, no less. And you know, how many years had it been between drinks for Melbourne? Uh, 67. 60, 67, Yep. And no, also, fifty-seven. Sorry, fifty-seven. Sorry, I've led you. I've led you yep. astray there. Yeah. Well, uh, we've we'll, we'll, we can we don't need to fact check it. Yeah, we we're, got uh, we're, yeah, we're <laughs> <laughs> And you've also become a father. Yep. Is in that, the space of two weeks, which is pretty crazy. Well, when. So in, in, in strange circumstances, you know, and I, I often, because there's people who listen to this show all over the world, and I like to be inclusive to yeah. make sure they know what's going on. Um, for those who follow footy, they had to, with in the middle of the pandemic, so many things changed and the AFL Grand Final or the, you know, the version of the, the Super Bowl or whatever you name it is always at the same place, at the MCG, the Melbourne Cricket Ground. Last year broke with hundreds of years of tradition and it was held in Perth and you know arguably the biggest biggest moment in in your career probably everyone's career who've been involved in the club for so long how was it to sort of be doing it as literally as far away as you could possibly do it like in Australia I'm glad with the diverse listeners you described and broke down that event and not how we conceived George I did think maybe you were trying to oh. go down that path as well and just let everyone know <laughs> that side as well but no the the grand final it's been a crazy couple of years mm. in every sport worldwide and ours, uh, ours included. Um, but moving the grand final to Perth is very weird for a supporter base. But as a player, it's sort of just, um, all right, we just roll with emotions. Let's go play in Perth. Um, a football ground's a football ground. And to be fair, we hadn't played in front of a full crowd for a, a while. So to have a full crowd in Perth was pretty special. And um, we got around that. Like We were only there for six weeks. Um, the year before we were in a, in a hub or a time away for 90 days. Um, so it was seen as like a little ho holiday compared to that. Um, but there, there were, there were certain tough periods. Um, Jake Lever, a friend of mine had a two week old girl. 
Um, and now knowing what it's like for two weeks, that's a time in, that you really feel like you should be at home helping because um, two to six weeks is pretty crazy and they develop so quickly in that time. So yeah. for him to be away for that, Ben Brown, similar. I think his, his youngest daughter was maybe a month old. Um, obviously, mine, uh, Jess was pregnant. Uh, Nathan Jones's wife was pregnant with twins. Um, so the, the parking that to go perform, like I understand parking that to get out of Melbourne and the privilege that we had to do that while everyone else is in lockdown and go to a state that for, that you're from that you can't even get to, but we can yeah. because we play football. That's an amazing privilege. But we still have to perform as well. So that's the bit that, 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 that sort of gets missing there. We still have to perform. Mm. Um, so we need Jake Lever in the best mindset possible. So how do we do that while he's got a two-week-old that he's left at home and maybe getting a call from his wife every night saying, this is a shit show back here. Like, how do we make sure Jake performs? And I feel like we got that balance right. Um, we had amazing amounts of support there. And Jake Lever has an amazing final series and, and goes and wins a medal. Um, I think that's what we saw it as. We're like, we've done all this sacrifice now. We've got to bring home a medal to make it worth you it. You owe it to yourself. Yeah. I, and that's something that obviously is much talked about, particularly in the landscape in Australia. But is there anything you would describe as like a bit of a special source? Like, did you guys sort of, obviously it bonded you together even stronger knowing that everyone had a story of, you know, someone they've left behind family member or, you know, whatever it may be, where you're like, you kind of got together and said, come on, let's, we've, we've given up a lot whilst in the eyes of, you know, the public, you know, being in a privileged position to continue work and, and ply your trade. Was there something that you guys, you, would you have regular check-ins to say, come on, let's keep, keep going? Yeah. It was a unique experience because there's 23 players that didn't play and 19 of them knew they weren't going to play. Mm. So they've got 19 guys who have played their last game of football as well. Um, and for those that are diverse listeners, when you finish your season here, you normally go on a good week drinking a piss. Yeah. So those guys are in that headspace. So being able to deal with them, it actually made it quite refreshing. It made us forget about football because there's yep. 19 guys that te- technically had... Um, although they trained to a high level still, which kept us mm. going and tick, ticking along. Mad Jack kicked four on me in a practice match the week before the granny. Yeah. Aaron Vandenberg made Clay Oliver look absolute rubbish. Like Aaron yeah. Vandenberg tore him apart. So these guys did their part and helped us train and helped us win a flag. Um, but yeah, the unique learnings that we learned from the Queensland 90 days, um, almost from a government point of view as well, we sort of were allowed to, if we kicked up as much fuss as we could, Mm. We could get our partners in, we could get our families in, we could move hotels, we could move a room in a hotel. Perth was like, you're staying here, no family's coming. And that's how whether, it is. Whether you yeah. like it or not, which sort of got us in the mood that, like, yeah, all right, that, that is the cards we've been dealt. Let's build, build something around it, which we did. Joondalup Resort, which um, those people who listen in WA, it's, I mean, it's the Casey, it's the Casey Fields of WA. It's about <laughs> half an hour out of town. <laughs> yep. Um, but we made it our own. We loved it out, 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 out there. Once we were allowed out of quarantine, the golf course was a super way for people to feel like they're um, doing stuff like they are back at home and making sure just because we're together, you don't just schedule things in because we're together. You got to make it feel like you're at home. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the big things, the difference between Queensland and and, 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 and Perth in those two different hubs is making sure that people felt like they're just at home while being in Perth. Yeah. I think that, yeah, that's that's not sp- spoken about enough as well. The I I often talk about amongst friends, you know, there's a there's a there's a double standard that professional sports people or say in general are held to where you get to live a life that few do, you know, acts as a certain thing, but also you're held to a double standard whenever you act like a human being, whether it be make a mistake or be honest or transparent, authentic, you're generally condemned for it. So I, 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 don't, I think there's a, there's a big disconnect between the general public and elite athletes knowing that, you know, they are just humans too. You yeah. know, and I, I, those things. I did find that challenging, the narrative, especially in the first hub. The second hub wasn't as bad. The WA mm. one, I think people would come accustomed to what happens with sport players at the moment. But the first one, the narrative around how lucky we were, which we were, I, I stand by it. You couldn't go to your letterbox without maybe getting a fine <laughs> and wearing a mask where we were allowed to go to the beach and be in sunny Queensland. I understand that. But as soon as I had a bad game, we had a horrible game against Port Adelaide. And our former president who was an, in, in Melbourne come out and condemned our performance. Like we're we're still subject to performing while being away. My wife was at home for 90 days by herself 
in a regional town that I took her to. Like there was a fair bit of pressure on me <laughs> to um, to go out and perform as captain, but then also there's so much pressure on me for leaving my wife at home in a regional town where there's no family or friends anywhere near her. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was the narrative I struggled with a lot. Um, but I, like I said, I stand by the privilege that we had to get out of Melbourne. I still, I still understand that part as well. Was it everything you thought it would be winning a grand final as captain? Remove, remove the fact that it's say not at the G and, and that sort of stuff, you know? I was, we got to do something unique in the fact that it wasn't at the G. Um, I'd like to think I've, I'd, I'll be given a chance at some point, um, whether that's I'll make finals again, and that's my chance to make it through finals. Like the, we'll, we got a good enough team to be in and around the mark at some point in my career. Um, and that one will be at the MCG most likely. So hopefully I get to experience it. Um, but the Perth one, what I'm thinking is if I'm in Melbourne and we win it, I might not see my teammates. Like uh, I might be with my friends and family because they can all come to the game. Someone else will be with their friends and family. No one can all bring their friends and family to the same function. Otherwise, you'll need a, maybe the Palladium because that's yep. suddenly a, you can maybe fit it. Um, you might not see each other as much. When you're in Perth and it was just the 70 of us, it was the 40 players plus the 30 staff, it was just a rolling tour of us 70 going to wherever we wanted, doing whatever we want with no family commitments or friend commitments yeah. or, or outside life commitments. And it made the week so special. Um, after the game, I, di- I have been quoted saying, um, I got that slight miss in the first hour or two, not seeing friends and family. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, we had guys that did have some people in the rooms. Like Brayshaw had his whole family there. Yep. Luke Jackson and Trent Rivers are from Perth. There was a couple of Adelaide boys that were able to get their family mm-hmm. across. So there was a bit... And seeing that made me a bit jealous when I'm on FaceTime uh, to my wife back at home and um, my parents. And then, but once... All the family left and it was just the 70 of us at about 11 o'clock in the change rooms in Perth. We just put on some of the best sing-along songs you can think of. Sweet Caroline, for example, and played it in, inside the Frio, the Frio rooms. Thanks okay. to Frio for letting us have, have your rooms, but I think we destroyed a couple of TVs with champagne. <laughs> um, and I could have caught the red eye home that night. That was pure. That was the best hour of my life. Yep. So do you do all this hard work for the best hour of your life? Like it's, that, that seems weird. Now I've looked back and I do have some sense of satisfaction that I was able to tick off a long-term goal. Um, but uh, it's a lot of work for an hour of fun. <laughs> and speaking of experiences, what do you think? Oh, actually, I need to give you some kudos because that's, I reckon, the first time since I've known you, you've pronounced the city of Joondalup correctly. Yeah, right. I think it was like Joondalup yeah, or I was running with, or... Well, I was there for long enough. Yeah, um, yeah. And a lot of people were correcting me. I was doing a fair bit of media, obviously, leading into the grand final. Um, and yeah, some Perth radio were getting pretty angry at me at some point. I'll probably give you a key to the city or something like that. You know, they might have taken <laughs> it off Dom Sheed and then they'll give it uh, give it to you. <laughs> Dom Sheed still have one, surely. I In fact, a, I that's... think the whole West Coast team have a key to the city. When I was there, I just was getting a general vibe that one, Perthians love football. Mm. Like m- almost more than Melbournians. Like there's a, there's a serious love for football there, but... The difference between West Coast and Frio is phenomenal. For support? For support mm. and uh, public stance. And I imagine if Adam Simpson said something and Tr- Justin Longmire said something, Adam Simpsons would be on every paper and Justin Longmire might make an appearance somewhere on SBS News or something like that. Like, yeah, I feel like West Coast are just the shit. Uh, yeah, that, that's often said as well. Like, yeah. they can do no wrong yeah. and Frio just cop it, you know, all the time and... Who knows, seeing how this season goes, you know, could be, you know, looks like free are off sort of on a, on a trajectory flip. and stuff. And, you know, West Coast are, are trying well, to. Well, when I'm guessing tough. 2015, when Freo made the granny and West Coast may not have even been the finals. I can't remember. I don't think they were because they were on the bottom for a little bit just before their. Premiership. Yes, they had a bit of a bit of a lean run. Um, I don't think it flipped then, did it? No. No. Like, the, <laughs> the, like and I've got some family members who are passionate Freo fans. Yep. And, like, like, even my brother in law, who's played like, a lot of footy, good footballer. It's like he gets so passionate when he talks about Frio, almost to the point where he doesn't make sense, but yeah. he has the potential to make, you know, outlandish small statements. Man, small and man things. syndrome a little bit. Uh, well, he's a big man. Yeah. No, he's. Um, small man syndrome in terms of stature of the club. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like just all, like, always like hard done by. And in that instance, they, they probably are yeah. as well. But I think also West Coast fans, like I said, and I am one, 
have had it so good for so long. You could count on one hand yeah. how many seasons they finished in the bottom three. Yeah. The rest of the time they've been pretty competitive. So I feel like, you know, a bit, bit whingy. And I don't really see it because I'm born in 91 and started to love football around 2000. Yep. So I don't, I don't see this West Coast Freer divide. I see them both as AFL clubs yes. that have been mm. here for, since I started going for AFL. Same as Adelaide Port, yep. where if you're talking to a boomer or Generation X or someone that's been around and seen a lot of West Coast Freo and seen them come into the comp, then they tend to have a bit more of a stance on it. Well, and, and growing up, so how long did you spend? Because obviously, you, were you born in New Zealand? Born there, there for a couple of months. Right, okay. But you, it you, depends. A- I, I, I would say that Openly, especially around cricket time, around the summer when New Zealand I, when New Zealand lost to Bangladesh in the first test of the summer, mm-hmm. I jumped back on the Australian wagon just for a little bit. <laughs> um, and then now Australia seems to be performing well in Pakistan, so maybe I'm jumping back on Australia. But um, I, I pick and choose when I say I'm from New Zealand uh, in and around sport. Right. Okay. Well, I I, I see like you know you, you I I've seen you be pretty consistent you know, okay. with your, your support with uh, with New Zealand, and I've come to like I'll admit. Like 15 years ago, not that I didn't care much for Kev, I was just like, eh, you know, like whatever. Now I, I think New Zealand and people from New Zealand, Kiwis, grossly underrated people, yep. like amazing people. Like you, you've, you're hard pressed to come across a, uh, a bad one. I feel like they're just, uh, you know, a smaller, more chilled out version of Canada. You yep. know, everyone's kind of like friendly, you know, got great snow, that sort of stuff. But yeah, underrated. The, it's a similar setup mm. to America and Canada. Do you get back there often? Uh, I did. Obviously not for two years. Yep. Um, there was a bubble there where I almost sl- almost went. Mm. I think Melbourne had the least time in that bubble, but I feel like we had maybe a week yep. where I was a chance to go. Um, Mum and dad did go. Uh, my granddad um, is getting old and, 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 and frail, so I, would, I wouldn't mind trying to catch up with him at some point. Uh, but yeah, all my, all, everyone's there but mum and dad and my two brothers. Have, they, have you ever been approached to do any publicity for New Zealand? You know, like, you know, I did have the most Zi- refreshing interview I've ever had. It's, this could trump it okay. today. But with uh, New Zealand radio pre-grand <laughs> final. Right. So they've obviously... Um, my uncle and auntie and uh, are mad football fans that live in West Coast yep. of New Zealand. And there's not much from my country town. There's one uh, All Black. And then there was one guy who played for Melbourne Storm. And that... So in yeah. this town, there's two people that have played sport in New Zealand's code, so rugby, and then I've managed to play football. So it's not much. What town's that? Greymouth. Right. Um, named after what it looks like. It's it's not a, <laughs> a it's not a beautiful place. Um, <laughs> to hide anyone in Greymouth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they just were asking some of the most beautiful questions, like stuff about like, oh, what happens after you kick a goal? Like, there's a ball. Oh, the right. Center. Okay. And then like a little bit of other refreshing stuff. And um, I actually had a good chin wag with this. Uh, I did too. There was one with a guy I didn't know. And then there was one of Israel Dag, who's a, who was a fullback for the All Blacks, who yep. does the SEN radio show in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. And I just had the best chat of him. And I suppose like, you know, just our genuine curiosity and enthusiasm yeah. for, you know... Um, well, like arguably, would you be, you know, like Greymouth's greatest favourite son now? Yeah. Reckon you've gone to that uh, that status? And and just some of the like some of the questions. Obviously, it's a Wikipedia job, and they've gone. So I see here that you struggled for six years to make your team before your breakout game in round 15, 2005. Just reading straight from the page. <laughs> uh, well, look, it's been, and yeah, you know, for those who do like get on like you know Wikipedia and all that sort of stuff, you know, you're your pathway to success has definitely not been linear, you know, um, and like much documented about, um, you know, when you, you know, some of the, the choices that you made when you were like younger and that sort of stuff. And like you can, and for those who, who, who want to go like Google it as well, like, you know, caught having a smoke like in your first year and, and whatnot. But on the theme of footy, like from the times I've chatted to you before, like you, you've said that you're not one to, to want to fall into like traditional stereotypes as a man, you know, as a, as an athlete. Can you tell me a bit more about that? If my life was linear, I'd go do something stupid to break mm. it up. If that makes sense. Like I, I, I feel like linear just doesn't suit me. I don't mm. suit sitting on that straight line the whole way. Um, my wife is actually quite funny. She's almost the opposite where I take chances. I'm not saying Jess doesn't take chances, but 
I want to do it today. Like if mm-hmm. I come up with something that I think could be life changing, I want to do it today. Where Jess will be a six nine month approach, work yeah. out the pros and cons of everything. So it's quite funny. Where I'm my mother's son, and she's definitely her father's daughter. Where yeah. where we're, we're taken after our parents. My mum is the most impulse person in the world. Um, and going on, my mum, I literally more and more I realise what I'm doing. I copy my mum in everything I do. Like as I get older, everything she does, I want to do. She she's made the hospitality seem like the job of jobs. Like growing up, I've always wanted to be in, hosp- in hospitality just because my mum is. Hospitality is a shocking job. Tough. Like, and the people in it would tell, tell me to stay, stay away from it. But mum's made it seem like it's the best job in the world. So it's all I want to do. So um, the more I get older, the more I realise that mum's my hero and everything I do is because of her. Um, but back to the stereotypical side of football, I just felt... I've got my own narrative on how I've done mine and I don't feel like I've done it differently because I know myself. I've just been myself. Mm. But myself has seemed to be quite different. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd put my hand up and say I wish I didn't smoke a dart on the way to training. But I'm also not taking... I, I wouldn't take that back now that I've done it. Mm. Um, one, it set me up quite funnily commercially um, because it's a, a little quirk. Like if I had have got delisted after a year, it would be the thing haunting me for the rest of my mm. life. Um, but I've managed to kick on post that dart and it's <laughs> <laughs> it's been quite a little thing that's just sat there. Um, but also just uh, the different approach I had to coming in, like um, the private big public school. Uh, now that we, we get a we get, there's a lot of public school boys now it's quite it's were quite you different. public i was i was i was public yeah and i was public in an area where there was a lot of private schools in a in right. a in a melbourne so basically if i was talented you're in one of those schools right um they've those schools are very good at recruiting footballers and getting them in their system by year 10 um so i must have been showing much at year 10 to be right. honest so, so not, like not on the radar not on the radar stage, at all yeah. I, had, I, were you as tall as you were i was then? but I'd, I'd moved from city of frankston where i yep. grew up to into this area in and around year eight yeah so maybe i just wasn't on radars and maybe i didn't play good footy in year nine mm. which is the one that you need to to then is that the key year i think year so i think year 10 is when your scholarship stuff starts right starts going once again you're talking to someone that has no idea about mm. this system um is it aps or ags a you wouldn't even know either. I wouldn't. What for the, the yeah private the, the, the school private system. school system's called like APS, I think. Uh, yeah. St. Kevin's Scotch. Yeah, Scabman, um, can you uh, look that up for us, mate? Well, he's wearing no. he's wearing a Roger Federer hat, so I, and <laughs> and you, you and, and, no, and a collar. So I thought he would have definitely been like APS. He's, he's a man of mystery, but <laughs> he didn't grow up in Melbourne either. So okay. he'll be um, I in Perth it was like something PS. Yeah. PS PSA. No, it's not that here. I know oh, that. but that, it's definitely Perth, though, like yeah, public school. Yeah, sorry, private school association. Yeah. Anyway, digress. So that's obviously a little bit different. The first place. Then I'm this tall, quirky guy who, um, APS. You were right. But there's two. Then there's another one which is this level below. No, AGS I reckon, which are the guys who play Wednesdays, which is like Wesley. Oh, is that bad? What day did you play? Saturdays? No, the way this, our school doesn't play footy. <laughs> oh, all right, okay. <laughs> our, our school works on their, 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 their jazz music. Right, yeah. art school. Yeah. All my friends are actually really good at music and a lot of them are in bands and stuff like that because I grew, there was more of a music school. Right. So I'm like a bit of the odd one out. So um, they didn't even have a footy team? No, we, right. we played at a local football club. Yep. Yep. Our, our football day was around Robin Day where we played the other public schools in the area. Oh. Two five and a halfs. Yeah, no good. Yeah, no good. <laughs> like, no not no trying. good. Yeah. yeah, actually, you picked the other sports. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're you like, go, I'm going to take up. What, what did you play instead? Well, we had a big volleyball school. Yeah, So right. it was a lot of yep. volleyball. Beach and indoor, I loved both. Yep. Um, so I actually didn't play school footy a few times. You're right. Um, so, yeah, and then what I walked into was um, football a decade ago was um, different to what it is now. Mm. Now we've got millennials and millennials have changed the world. Millennials yep. do what they want. Um, in every industry, millennials mm. just do what they want. And that's happened in footy as well. So when I first got to the club, it was speak when spoken to and you'll bite your time. Now it's like, I have to go ask a millennial for advice as captain. Like it's now it's like swung the complete other way. Mm. Um, so football's in a great space now um, and most industries are. But when I, when I first got to the club, it was very speak when spoken to. Um, you'll earn your stripes. And I, there is a bit of that. I don't mind that. Yeah. Earning your jumper is a big thing in football and I like people having to earn their jumper. Um, 
yeah, so that's just little things like that I would change about football clubs and um, I feel like I have with ours. It's okay to be the person you are. Um, if I was asked to be someone that wasn't Max Gorn, I would have been out of the system in two, three years. Yep. But uh, with a couple of good mentors, I had Jim Steins there for, mm. for a couple of years and everyone knows, hopefully, in and around Australia who Jim Steins was and those that don't, he, he's a footballer who come from Ireland, uh, which is very rare when he did. Um, and... Uh, in about his 200th game when he's become a Brownlow medalist, which is the best player in the league, he all of a sudden starts a charity to help out uh, adolescent teens trying to become the best versions of themselves. Um, and he pinpointed me. He was the president of our football club and a past great that, that pinpointed me as one of those guys. And him allowing me to be myself or give me confidence to be myself um, really made me feel a little bit more comfortable in my own skin. Um, and for some reason, tall kids always take a little bit longer in feeling mm. comfortable in their own skin. People think it's to get accustomed with the game but we're not comfortable in our own skin yep. first once we are comfortable being tall and loving being tall then we play tall then we enjoy being tall I remember you've said to me a few times before and not just with footy other sports like it traditionally it used to be the thing like you'd give someone a bit of a raz when they got to the club you know kind of like you know pick on them and that would like you know you just, oh it's banter you know if you give someone a silly nickname or this or that but in conversation you've shared with me that you often will just, you'll pump someone up, like, you know, make a point of, you know, based on a lot of, like, your experience, but instead of just taking the piss out of someone because that's what's been done or, you know, a lot of them say, oh, you know, it means they're accepted if, you know, you make a joke about them. You said you'd actually just go pump someone up, like give them some, you know, give them like a genuine rev up, you know, say, you know, well done or, you know, you did this great or that sort of thing. Like, have you noticed that that has, has anyone come back to you and said, oh, you know, they appreciate that or, you know, an impact that that's had on the group? It's, um... That's the hardest part of being a leader, in my eyes, is Australian culture and Australian men, my way of showing that I like you is to make fun of you. For some reason, that, that, that's, that's in our culture, and especially in footy. It would be, uh, nice hat, Dusty. <laughs> I wouldn't wear that. And then, all, <laughs> and then that would be my way of being like, I'm, I'm, I'm endearing. Like, mm. I, I enjoy your company. Um, and the balance of that at the football club is still there. If you still rocked up with that hat, and to be honest, I've, I've only picked, your hat's nice, I do like your hat. Thank you. But I'm using Sonic as an example. If you walked in with a hat at the football club, I didn't like it. I think it's still okay to say nice hat if I've got a relationship with you. Mm. But from a performance point of view, and this is the biggest change we made at the end of 2020, is I won't say this is a shocking interview because this is, this is your job. This is what you're yep. doing. And if I said this is a shocking inter in interview, what that does for your performance goes backwards. So the example I use is Jake Lever. Jake Lever takes 10 intercept marks in a game of football at the MCG, walks off the MCG, and he is up here. Like, he is as high as anything. He's all from his own performance. So we've got him feeling the best he has, and he's as confident as he's ever been. And then in the change rooms, we go, geez, I could have taken 10 marks if I played on no one like you. And, and he does play on someone, but that's his narrative that like he yeah. drops off and doesn't play on anyone. So we've got Jake up here and then out of our own accord, we brought him down here for just for a, just for a laugh. Just because. Like, just, yeah, just, like, yeah. just, just because. And then by next week, will Jake get back to there where he was or mm. do we, did, did we just bring him down and now all of a sudden we've lost a chance of him being confident for four or five weeks before mm. maybe having a bad game. Um, and that happens, that happens in every industry as well. Um, but in football, it's prevalent because it's an Aussie man culture to bring someone down for some, for some weird reason. Um, so to still have that imbalances, but to also show a bit of a care around performance, because that's the one that really hits you. Mm. Performance is the one that hits you because that's the one you're proud of. That's the one you work your ass off over pre-season to get right and your family are all there watching. Performance is the one that matters. Um, and that's, I, I still struggle with that today. I still have to write down in my notebook every night and go... Did I get that right? Did I get that wrong? Did I say this to this person? I think I did. I might need to apologize to him tomorrow just to say I, I didn't mean it like that or I didn't think before I said it because um, it is hard. I think that the fact you've tied that like, you know, leadership into performance, what about when, because like, I, I agree with you and not that I've been in similar leadership positions, but some of the best advice I ever got with someone from footy, uh, Kenny Quartermain, you know, Katanning football legend, he said he was coaching me in the in the Colts when I was like 16, 17. He goes, it takes just as much energy to pump someone up as it does to to cut them down. And 
What about in times where some feedback needs to be given around performance? Do you still, do you do the, which is like the old shit, you know, shit sandwich, like two bits of positive stuff and then the bad stuff in the middle? Or do you say, hey, like, great job, X, Y, and Z, and then leave it because there's timing come into it and then say, when you're reviewing tape, say, look, here's some things you could work on. My, my reviews in leadership, I was in the leadership group for five years leading into being captain. So I, I was getting a lot of reviews on how I was leading and this conversation, how did that go? And a lot of it was you don't have to tie a joke in when you do it, which is a little bit of your shit sandwich. Because mm. um, I'm a, I'm a, I, I feel like I enjoy humor. I feel like humor is a part of me. Um, and I want to bring that even into a, a criticism or a conversation around performance. Um, and that was my working area. Like they say, you just got to don't put that joke on the end or don't put that joke on the end. I've kept the joke. <laughs> I've stayed strong on the joke <laughs> and the joke will remain. They'll, I will try and light it up at some point within that conversation. But it's important that I know the person I'm talking to, um, the area I can bring it in. But most importantly, I don't shadow what I need to say. Like I don't cover up what I need to say with humor. Mm. So I get what I need to say through, but then we can have a conversation. It doesn't just go for one minute. I tick that thing off, um, and then it goes, and then it goes forward. Um, and 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 you talk about the the I know that you said before about your coach always said pod, it takes as many uh, as much energy to say mm. something positive as negative. Even at my age now, at thirty, uh, going on thirty one, I was having a bit, I was feeling a bit rough at the start of this preseason. Um, my thirteenth one, I wasn't running as good as I thought I was. Um, I felt like I wasn't training as well. Um, and then I, I come out and had a good week and out of nowhere, I had about seven or eight of my teammates tell me that I they couldn't believe how well I went this week. And you should have seen me the next five weeks. Like I was sky high. Yeah. Like I, and it's amazing that even at my age, what I think I don't need positivity from my teammates, but I do because I was in a little bit of a slump. Um, so that, that, that point is correct. But negative, like a, 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 sorry, a not negative, but a working point uh, to, to be given or um, a criticism about something um, is still as important as well. I, I'm like, glad you, you shared that because I have a similarity in a, in a work performance. Like at, uh, at, at work, I, always, I often find it hard to accept compliments. And if somebody goes, oh, good job with X, Y, or Z, I'll be like, oh, no, it was a team effort. Or instead of just going like, thank you, like I received that. And I also realize that sometimes I do need a pat on the back to say, well done, you've done well, you, you know, good job. And, and that sort of stuff's important. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting to hear that even someone, you know, um, in the profession you are you know, at the highest level, that's still, that's still relevant. Yeah. And sometimes I sit there uh, with our other leaders and we talk about maybe giving a pump up to a kid. And I'm like, oh, oh does it really matter? Like, and then you just get, you get a pump up yourself 13 mm. years on, you go, yeah, it does. Like yep. it matters almost more than anything you're even thinking of. Like it matters more than the four one Ks he's about to do. Mm. Like getting him in the right headspace and feeling like he's comfortable with how he's performing. Um, that fast tracks. That fast tracks relationships. Fast tracks success. Fast tracks his own improvement. Yep. We have been in the. We we've both been in the same job for a while. Um, yeah, it's yeah, funny. True. I said to Jess. Yes. I said to my wife the other day. Um, I said I really love change, like, and I was getting into her that she that she doesn't like change. She goes, "What do you mean? You've been in the same job for thirteen years. You you you, you literally wake it ever since you the day you turn eighteen. I've been doing the same thing for thirteen years, walking through the same doors, and I'm trying to pretend that I like change. I don't think I do. Let's say, you know, as you talk about, like, as a turning point. Say the dart. Let's say that hadn't worked out so well for you, you know, and you, you're out of footy. Yep. Into like, where? What would you be doing, or what would you have done? Do you think? I, I I'm guessing I am what my mates are. Um, I'm still very well connected with my mm. with my McKinnon High School friends. Um, we still we actually went for a bike ride on on, on the weekend. It was good. I feel like I'd just be one of them again. Like mm. I'd, I'd be back. A few of them have gone into full time work. A couple of tradies. A couple of guys mm. went to uni. Um, I would have been somewhere in and around there. I would have probably still been in awe of my mum and wanted mm. to do hospital hospo at some point. Um, so if that's saving every dollar I can as a barista for 10 years before I go out on my own or something like that, I felt like that would be something I'd do. Um, I was at Domino's before I got drafted, probably could have stayed there. Yeah, how'd that go? Well, like, did you have to take your own car or you get the Domino's car for that? Well, I never got to 18. 
Right. Um, so yeah, the my my goal was to be a delivery driver, but, but I you just, were just making. I just, them I just couldn't get there by the age I was. By I would, so I still want to be a delivery driver because when so you're, you're putting it out there, someone needs a delivery driver. In when them, you're you a 15 year old at Domino's, all you're doing is go, geez. Why am I here making pizzas? I want to be that guy who's out doing deliveries. Dougie. Yeah, I want boy. to be Dougie out there doing deliveries. They get paid more. They get tips. I'm in here making pizzas, working my ass off. Well, you and you spoke a lot about hospo. Like, are you when you're in a are you a big tipper, generous tipper? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, what, what's your thoughts on you know tipping and and service and hospitality? What do you look for? What do you think's good? What do you think's bad? Uh, good question. Um. I I'm a big tipper in when I'm over, over, mm. overseas because it's obviously not in our culture for some reason mm. um, because hospitality rates aren't too bad compared to yep. other other countries as well though um, maybe some Australian hospitality people won't like me saying that because they probably want more money and they should um, but I'm I'm I, I'm always a big fan of if it's a five buck uh, four fifty coffee I'll give the fifty cents yep I'm a big fan of that I've 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 only ever once bought a coffee for the person behind me not knowing who he is. Um, Paid it forward. Yeah, the old mystery coffee to yeah. someone who comes up. Um, I've done that once. Um, don't know, I just didn't get as much enjoyment out of not knowing who who got mm. it. Um, but in terms of tipping, I've, I don't have a real big stance on it. Mm. Like if someone blew my mind away and it was unbelievable service, but I had 200 bucks cash and the meal comes to 198, I wouldn't fetch more money for cash tipping yeah. so sorry the, the in, in, Austra- in the Australian in environment the, that is yeah, the where it's, yeah even though that blew my mind away I think like and particularly now hospos in is doing it tough you yeah. know there's there's hardly anyone here to work in in those sort of things so and and you definitely see it as well and I think a bit of bit of patience and compassion and common sense moving forward is generally the way to go but you you see those people who like really enjoy their job and are really good at it yeah. you know they come out no notepad. They've remembered. They've memorised what you're going to be, you know, eating, what you're going to be drinking, and and whatnot. So we have obviously, I've I've got a bar myself, and we've got some some beautiful staff that work incredible hours at two free venues. Some of them, um, and they come in with a smile on their face, and I sit there and just in awe of mm. how they're able to. Um, it's like local footballers train after they work, mm. and I sit there and I I bitch and moan sometimes to our high performance manager if we have to train at midday rather than nine a.m. or we got a long day today. Like it's obviously we've got some stresses and performance stuff within our industry as well, um, but we are very lucky to be footballers. Like we've got a job to come in and smile. It's a job that we all love. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing it. And if you do fall out of love, it's pretty funny how quickly you exit the system. Mm. You start performing a bit poorly just because you're unhappy in the place you're at. Um, so you got to make sure you love what you're doing. And I do love what I'm doing. Um, and it makes it easy to come to work and smile. So I'm presuming the hospitality folk that love what they're doing and love the place they come to and the environment that I create at my bar is a nice environment where um, everything gets ticked off and they're happy there, then bang, they're happy and we get better service and in the end, everyone's, everyone's better off. Makes a difference when you come across people who really love what they do they don't know of the saying is that you, know, you love what you do you never work a day in your life but their enthusiasm profession it all just shines through they don't need to try any harder but you just know they enjoy their work and they make sure you know they want to make the environment around them as enjoyable uh, as possible yeah mm. and uh, there's a you are what you are like mm. you don't know what you don't know there's two horrible sayings but i've given them to both of you at yeah. the one time but I'm, I'm gonna have stresses and anxieties around what what I do, even though as some people out there would love to do my job, and I get that, would drop anything to do my job, but I don't know their job, they don't know my job, they don't know the stresses and anxieties involved with mm. what my life is, I don't know what their stresses and anxieties are involved in their life, so um, you do come across a lot of Twitter fun sometimes. Yeah, interesting space What a great app Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. yeah. I love it, I'm a big fan of it, um, one, because I follow a sport that's it's not in the mainstream media mm. at all. So I have to have Twitter to follow cycling. Yep. Um, and two, I actually don't mind ruffling a couple of feathers every now and then and putting a quirky little tweet out. The other day I spelt potatoes wrong. <laughs> um, I felt like it was a good tweet because potato cakes I think are better than dim sims. The cat bag. But I spelt potatoes wrong and <laughs> I feel like half the people were in, getting into me because dim sims are clearly better than potato cakes to a lot of people. Mm. Um, it does make sense. It's more in a dim sim, but I think like a bad dim sim is bad. Yeah, it depends how long it's been there. For. Yeah. Same with the potato cake. But a potato well. cake, if it's crispier, if it oh. stays in the deep fryer for four weeks, it gets even better. You know. Did you did you ever when you had like family fish and chip night? Was potato cakes in there? Yeah. Yeah. 
And well, it's always the one they chuck in one more. So like, yes. I, there's a beautiful general store near where I live called Cunha that you go there for two potato cakes, especially towards the end of the day at like 3.30 when they've been sitting in there for ages. What are those? <laughs> what are the ovens called? Bain Marie. Bain, Bain Marie. <laughs> it's been sitting there for a while um, and there's seven left. They'll give me six. Yep. I'm like, no worries. Like, I, <laughs> I really don't need to eat all six of these. I will, yep. but I really don't need to. Um, the crispy, the better. But back on social media. Um, I'm a big lover of Twitter, but I understand how poorly it can become from a mental health point of view, especially it, it, for a professional athlete. It leans to be more of a negative space, yep. I've found. Or it can easily, I shouldn't say negative space, because yep. there's a lot of positivity on there, but it can easily turn there like pretty quickly. You know, yep. It's like a worldwide conversation where everyone essentially has a has can shout something out into the room, so yep. to speak. We had, yeah. a, we had a player um, who was going through a bit of a contract scandal um, I feel like he's, he, he, it got leaked out or maybe made up that he wanted this amount of money and bang, you're open to uh, the public scrutiny mm. then. And he deleted all social media. The best version of that person or the best version of yourself is a person that can be free on social media if, they, if, if that is what they're willing to be like. And that person was that guy and all of a sudden he deletes all social media and I feel like as a... As a Melbourne supporter, you're, you're shutting down this guy that we need one to win a flag mm. and, and, and two to perform. And we're the catalyst of him not performing. Um, so I couldn't believe I'm on Twitter to follow Jimmy Neesham, my favorite cricketer, or John Isner, my favorite tennis player. And yep. if these guys deleted Twitter, I would get off Twitter. Like, why, why are we making our athletes jump off? Yeah. it's Well, I think it goes back to what you were saying before about this. Australian thing of wanting to to sort of cut like tall poppy syndrome, yeah. right? And people want it, and it obviously those in the know. Or here's a news news flash for people who don't know it. Often, when you say something poor or negative about someone else, it's more of a reflection of you of you than it is about them, right? And the the fact that social media can like go that way, like I've always been curious, and I sometimes look at things through a rose colored glasses because I have the luxury of not being in the public eye or in the spotlight. Uh, and and things and I look at like press conferences which you do a lot of you know I've always said and it's easy from where I sit in the cheap seats but I would like to bring a refreshing take and just literally be honest with things and I know there's certain you get asked very baited and leading questions where you almost are painted into a corner where the only response you can give is is gonna start a story you know, you I'm know, glad like, you said that yeah and is there ever Times in like I know like in in press conference where you like obviously there's something you would probably like to say but you can't because either way it's going to make a headline or a story that you that you don't want or the, in in essence the narrative is already booked it's just a matter of what sound bites or what quotes you know go in there you know and I look at it for and not maybe even like sport but let's say uh, you know businesses in general and I use an example of remember when that BP uh, oil rig uh, blew up in the Gulf of Mexico, I don't know, was it five years ago, 10 years ago, something like that. And the CEO, just in an off-the-cuff comment, said, I just want my life back. You know, and gee, and look, not not the great, but it was just an honest comment from a man who was probably just as tired as everyone else and it wasn't his fault personally that it happened and he got shredded. You know, and I don't, I don't know what the, the outcome was, but the point I want to get to is maybe not necessarily on the negative side of things, but I, to be honest, I tune out to most sport press conferences, you know, whether it be coach, player, because I know you're going to get the the rollout lines that are going to minimise a, head, a headline, if you yep. will. Whereas I think let's say in the lead up to a game, what I would like to see as a as a fan is like, you know say, oh, how do you think you guys are going to go this weekend? Say, I think we're going to win. I think we can beat this team. I think I can kick five on this bloke. And I know you bring untoward. The individual who says it brings untoward pressure on them, but do you think that would ever be a possibility where athletes or people in those situations would be able to say what they think and detach or live free from the consequences? Okay, there's a lot. I know, and I've gone on a model. I and there's a lot going I'm, on in that I'm, space. I'm passionate about that. Sort I've of got thing. an answer that sits on both sides. Okay. Um, and Australian sports media is a long way behind America. A long way behind. In, in what way? Uh, access for one mm -hmm. I think the players uh, NBA players like they're allowed in the change rooms they have candid chats like while they're undressing in the change rooms like it's 
it's a little bit different in American culture. They are a little bit more self confident, a little bit more arrogant, and they do say stuff like, "We're going to win this weekend." It's celebrated correct, over there. Yeah. Correct. Um, where Australia is shut down, like we we're talking about well, before, be like, oh, oh, a bit fig jammy. If correct. you say, you know, back yourself. Um, there's also clickbait. Is is ba- I'll give you an example of what I last week. I was doing a, sh- uh, a talk in Geelong, um, and the guy who was running the wanted to sell a few more tickets and said, "I've got a relationship with a guy at the Geelong Advertiser." do you mind just having a bit of a chat and see if we can get it out on the Geelong advertiser so we can get some people to come into Geelong. So I said, yeah, we called. We talked to, didn't talk about the show at all. Um, To be fair, I just felt like he was going to write about the show somewhere in the article. Um, But we talked about all things footy. Back page of the Herald Sun. I didn't realise Geelong advertiser and the Herald Sun were friends. (laughs) But back page of the Herald Sun, there's an art, and I forget what the exact title of of the headline was, but it was like, Gone ready for round one in more ways than one. And it was pumping up the rivalry between Melbourne Doggies. Mm. And I didn't say anything about the rivalry of Melbourne Western Bulldogs. But the, 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 it was leading to the fact that I've added more salt into this rivalry, which I didn't. And it did not mention the show in the whole article. So I've done a favour for this guy to help out with the Geelong advertiser at a late moment so they can get an article and they didn't mention the show and tried to pump up a rivalry that I can't even remember talk, talk, talking about. So why would I be honest if my honesty is not going to be shown out at all? Which then leads to your original point about the lines of questioning as well. If I'm going to get asked about a, a question that I know is going to be back page of the paper if I answer it honestly, do I want that? Like that's a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety to deal with, not only me but my family. Um, so there's different ways to look at it, um, but I'm I am also the advocate that a strong media is a strong AFL and a strong AFL is a strong a strong industry all combined, and we all we all succeed from it. So I understand having relationships with the media, letting them in post game. Roman Bryan, best thing ever. Mm. Get two Roman Bryans. Get one in the losing rooms as well. Have you been on Roman Bryan? Uh, post a final. We really played Friday night, so it was quite hard. Yeah. Because it was only Friday night. But get one after every game. Get one in the losing rooms. Get the captain right in front of the camera as soon as we come off. I'm I'm all for that. The mm. halftime interviews coming off the ground. The more access, the better. But the clickbait stuff around, especially, uh, what do we call um, journalism that's written down? Is that like is that a thing? The, that's written down? Yeah, like the like, paper. Um, oh, um, I, I suppose. Are they... Just like a written form rather Long than form TV writing, form. Like, yeah. Is, um, it's quite dangerous. It can be misleading. It can be clickbait. It was, can it's be... probably slightly leans more towards tabloidy and it, sort and of stuff. Yeah. They get to choose what to write. They can ask you 15 questions and go, he answered these three, right? We'll just run with these three. Mm. Where the other 12 could have been about promoting my wine bar or talking about pumping up Tom Sparrow, this young footballer mm. who would love a pump up in the media and I feel that will come from it. But that didn't come up good in their article. So they'll just talk about that time that I said, West, Western Bulldogs will come last. I didn't say that. But, you know, like this, they, that won't go, I won't ring the hell after <laughs> this to say the Bulldogs will Western come Bulldogs last. Western Bulldogs won't yeah. come last. So yeah. they'll, be, they, they, they'll probably win it. Um, if obviously we will try and win it as well. Mm. See, I'm, I'm protecting myself. I yes, said they'll yeah, probably win it, and then <laughs> yeah, bang, I've gone. Oh no, someone's not going to like yeah, that. And then, if I don't the, say what, we'll win so it. that could have been extrapolated as like Max Gorn has no faith that Melbourne will win this Correct. year. If it was a, a what would you call it, like outrageous headlines or headlines out of context. Yeah, yeah. So you got to be, and so I'm all for TV media and radio media because you get to dictate what you do. Although I have seen some people cut off in radio when they didn't get to their point and stuff like that, but. Um, it's a little bit, you get to dictate it a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. And would you ever feel like in that instance, wanting to clarify on Twitter, say actually, or in, in that instance where it was the line about the Bulldogs was taken out of context, you're like, you know what? It's not the end of the world, you yeah. know? Um, and or is there ever times where you felt like you would or to, to clarify things that have been misrepresented in the media? Uh, I don't think I ever will. Yeah. Um, I've had one thing that's, and apologies to anyone that has sincerely, sincerely, yeah, yep. sincerely sent me a, di- a direct message um, about someone who has bad health, uh, who would love a shout out or anything like that. Um, but I've had a pretty strong stance for about eight years for my own health about not replying to DMs because mm. a lot of them are bad. And if you reply to a good one, you're most likely there goes the blanket rule, and you'll and you'll fight back at that guy that had a go at your left foot kick. Mm. So I've had a blanket rule of not replying to DMs. Even businesses that have tried to reach out, I'd like you to go through the proper ways and email mm. the email account that I have there of my manager. Yep. And we'll do it that way. I just, 
DMs can get me in a really bad space and it did when I was replying to them that I just don't. So unfortunately, and I'm not on Cameo and stuff like that because I, I, I don't enjoy I don't enjoy it from my own health point of view. I understand what the joy can bring if a video does come to someone sick or a young kid and I understand that and I'd love to be able to do one for everyone. Um, but yeah, DMs I've just, I've just stayed away from. One of my mates in Perth came up to you at the yeah. markets. And I was fine? Yeah, he's great. Oh, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> bit, Someone bit, from your hometown. I'm like, you sure? Floyd. Dusty said he only lives with six people. <laughs> There's <laughs> yeah. six people in the whole town. Are you one of them? <laughs> uh, he, he was rap, mate. Yeah. And he's probably not the sort of person who'd go up and, and like say good day and stuff. But I think also like, you know, I pump up like how good a guy you are and stuff. And, you know, they, they I think they just assume we're, we're hanging out all the time. Yeah, you know, yeah. But, you know, I want to talk to you about your beard. Okay. And you've like, you're, you're now... It's, I think, one of the become one of the most iconic Australian facial hairs that we've that we've had, and up there with say like a, a Murph Hughes situation, you know, iconic, you know, moustache. Um, Everyone you name, I'm going to be worried because they've kept it the whole well, way through. Well, that was okay. Murph's probably the first one that comes to Merv's mind. Murph's kept you know, it. Dipper's kept it. Booney's kept it. Booney's kept it. Yep. Um, like you know. Johnny Platten's kept his hair yeah. as long as he can. I think it's getting thin now. Um, Warwick Kappa kept the has kept the mullet. There's, there's, I mean, there's heaps in today's game. Nick Nat's got his hair. Yes. Um, Dyson Heppel had his hair and shaved. Yep. Um, Matt someone, Fife, does he count? No, nah, there was one? someone Not else that's got, that's got distinct hair. They're not millennials if any of them become famous and keep a mullet for the whole time. What happened... At the start of the the pandemic, <laughs> when everyone went to hubs, everyone was getting strange haircuts. Yeah. Like literally, just like they got attacked with the clippers it's for an inch above at, the ear. It's at home jobs, and they just don't care. Mm. I think I'm just salty because my hair's not not what it once yeah. used to be. Coming um, across a a millennial slash, I think there's a generation behind millennial now. What is it? Gen Z. Is it Gen Z? Yeah. Um, and then what's like George? Is it going to be Gen COVID? Is it going to be because baby boomers after the baby boomer rush? So is this going to be Gen what's, COVID? Uh, Scab man, can we work out if uh, children born in this period, in this what, period what the generations are? Are they going to be called COVID kids? COVID kids. Yeah. Sounds like a band. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Well, the post war guys are baby boomers. Um, the beard, okay. Yes. Gen C. Gen C for COVID? For COVID. Gen Oh, wait till the, Gen alpha. Wait till the alpha crew get in wow. charge. Wait till, wait till when Alphas are Prime Minister. That, that actually, yeah, genera- <laughs> I'm, I'm Generation Alpha. The President yeah. of the United States is from Alpha. <laughs> so, the had you... I don't even know like where to start. There's no real I, reason behind the start. It just happened and you I left can it? grow a beard and I've always right. been a big adv- advocate. If you can grow a beard without patches and without the bit mm. of ginge that goes through it and it all looks like it is growing in the mm. right area, it's a one colour, grow it. Grow up for at least a year in your life mm. or something like that because you can do what a lot of people can't do. Like the amount of beards that I know of... Oh, my baby's trying to say hello in the next room. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of people I know who try to grow a beard, they're patches and then everywhere. So I can grow a good beard. Mm. Well, I think I can. You I'm can. Not, you're, you probably have a bigger, better opinion than me. Is it a good beard? It is a good well, it's a, It's a strong beard no, because some... I saw a dude yesterday walking around. He had a long-ish beard, mm. like... But it wasn't a good one. Yeah. Like, it's just a bit wispy and stuff. Whereas yours is like strong. Good volume. I think good volume is important in a beard. Looking back on early photos of me with a beard, 2015, 2016, I've still got hair and the beard's twice as long. I'm like, that's disgusting. Oh, so I've done... I, I, and you also had a, had a bit of speak. You had a bit of hair back I'd, then. Uh, very similar to what you have now. Yes. And I had twice the size beard. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I do remember that now. It was yeah, yeah like, a and I look back on that and go, like, I met Jess in that period. I'm like, how the hell, how the hell did that happen? Um, well, I, I I got a theory on it because I've had a when we met, I had a beard. Yeah, I believe, and a ginger beard is is a bit of a stronger statement than most. Like, yeah. I had a, a a friend of mine, Phil Russo. Um, you know, great guy. He uh, he. Grew whiskers for a while, but he was like a proud Italian man. He had a bit of ginge in mm. it, and he was devastated. <laughs> He's like, "Nah, can't grow a beard." You can't, like, unfortunately, you can't grow a beard. No, but anyway, I've 
and uh, in the first month, mine looks real patchy, like yeah. it's not going anywhere, and so and it's really itchy. That first phase, like it's hard to hard yeah. to get through. Anyway, once I grew it and it was, and you know, I was getting the beard oil onto it, getting it shaped and stuff, and yeah, I, I it was it I was great. And but I would I, other people had such a fascination with it. So you'd go into places in a bar and your friends would just point at someone across the room and like not even saying anything you turn and look and it's another person with a beard yep. and you just give them a nod and you know I've had people buy me beers nightclubs pubs and bars and stuff mm. definitely if you walked past someone else with a beard it's like a yeah just, well, it's the same with that. height height's the same yeah okay unfortunately one thing you're probably not going to be able, oh no you're tall so I'm not sh- I wouldn't yeah. say I'm tall I'm not short but you don't have like Guys that are normally quite tall just talk mm. to normal other tall guys. I'm talking mm. like extreme height. Yes. They're the people that just give a little nod at bars and pubs and stuff. And so you understand. Yeah. Uh, you've you had a tough a, life. Yeah. You you've, get asked the questions yeah. too. You're unbelievable at sport, most likely. Um, but you've had to duck under doorways and uh, get booed at rock concerts because you're standing in front of people. Like, I understand. I understand your pain. Do you, what about people who are tall and maybe not athletically blessed? You know, do you feel like it's tougher for them? Because people just assume they play assume, basketball. and every second question I get without even knowing, if I come across someone that doesn't even know what football is, is you must play basketball. It's a very common mm. question, and to a point where I've got like I almost ignore them, and I feel sorry for they're probably a beautiful old lady that, that <laughs> usually says it. Um, you must play basketball. Well, th- no, I don't. I, I've never played basketball, and I'm not interested in playing basketball. It it's like the the one person who comes up for a photo. They think that might be the only person that day who's yeah. come up and asked you for a, for a photo and stuff, but. Back to the beard. Yep. No, I'm no oils or comb or anything. How do you how do you how do you look after the skin underneath? Because I and maybe I, this is a t- I got I got like beard dandruff. My skin got so dry underneath, and I put oil and washed it, and it just I'd scratch my beard on a black shirt, and it looked like someone got a salt shake. You've on slightly me. worried me now because it makes me feel like when I shave, my skin's going to be red raw or something. Yeah, well, like it, and it's fine like afterwards, but yeah, like it. Do you is is it does it require like a lot of a wash up, upkeep? Do you have special beard shampoo or just the same stuff you'd use on your scalp? Yeah, it's funny people, especially people in beard world, they all ask me these questions. Like, what yeah. do you do with it? I'm like, like just let it. Burn. I go to the barber a lot. I don't do yeah. it. It's not a home job. I like to go in and um, once again, I'm a people person. Mm. And if I love hospitality, I'm always going to love barber uh, workshops as well. They're pretty yeah. much a similar thing. Um, I'll go in there. All I do is shave my head, which I can do at home, and trim yep. a little bit off my beard, which How, I can do also do at home. Do you do it home. with a razor? Yeah, razor. Right. Okay. I go as I go as short as you can without going full like Nathan Jones. Nathan Jones. Yeah. Um, and it grows back really quick, so it's like a weekly thing. Yeah. Um, because you have a TV game every week. Um, <laughs> they're called TV game because when you play VFL when you're young, there's one the broadcast. There's game, one the game one, that yeah. gets a TV game. You yeah. go, it's a TV game this week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no one's watching it's ABC at one o'clock. Well, mate, I, I did that for a broadcast game. It was only radio, and I cleaned my boots <laughs> yeah. and stuff, and yeah. copped it ever since. But you know, it was an automatic two with yellow boots. But, <laughs> yeah. um, do you like eating? Do you find no. like no dramas with stuff getting caught in there, or um, milk if anything? But no. Yeah. Okay. Well. I'm the most boring beard person in terms of tricks and stuff. I can get caught in there and maintenance and. And have you would have been approached by many brands who might want to be pushing oils and contraptions? A little bit and here and there. Um, yeah, not not yeah. not as much as you'd think. Hmm. I, I think your best one was the Google stuff. Yeah. Like, hey Google. There's and a couple. You... In, there's a couple in the works at the moment. Oh, good. Good. Um, not yes. Google, not Google, but something can't, similar. Okay, that can't could, reveal. That, that will be quite fun. Can't can't really reveal. Um, and then can't another one got to do with, uh, uh, well, hair, but more body hair. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm looking forward to yeah. this now, mate. So, yeah. You're the you're a very marketable man. You yeah. Know, as we as as we know. The Google ads are so I get so well, putting that, myself out there. I get mad anxiety around it. Well, you you've shared that before. Yeah. That. You know, even like you've you've uh, you've got a book yep. out as well. Like you're hesitant to put too much out there. Is that because of what we discussed before? Like you know, a bit of tall poppy stuff. Like it's more for people to have a crack at you with. Or? Yeah, my my ideal life, and I keep telling myself, is to be on a ranch, four hundred kilometers away from the city. Yep. And uh, don't talk to anyone. But then I just keep uh, I keep wanting to do stuff. Um, at the same time, I'm only thirty. I don't need to be on a ranch at the moment. No. Um, so every time I do something and I, then I quickly realize I'm like, oh, what I just did 
it's probably going to go places. Like it's probably mm. going to be out there and I've got a chance to be shut down. I get real nervous about it. Even putting up a, as simple as an Instagram post. Mm. I could think about it for a week sometimes. Mm. So it's and for someone that I am, I mean, you might say this, so I, it, this is weird me saying it myself, but I feel like I come across quite natural in front of a camera or in front of a microphone. And when I do do something, you're like, oh, I probably just thought about that and put it up. Mm. It's not like that. And I say no to a lot of things because I don't, want to be out in the public eye as much as possible. So I get angry when Geelong advertiser gets me on the back page of the Herald Sun when I feel like I'm yes. helping out just to go to a Geelong show. Well, you've, and you, I think you've been very consistent. Like I've known you for a little while now and the fact that you, you have that humbleness in like almost to a fault where you, over and you don't want to, you know, necessarily put yourself out there, but you're, you know, you've gone into the stratosphere in the last, you know, three, four years. I've like mainly, primarily through, you know, the fact that you've been playing outstanding football and, you know, drought-breaking win and whatnot. But you mentioned to me once before, like, do you consider yourself a bit of a loner in in some capacity? Well, I think you, you have to be to be a professional footballer from the people you grow up with. Mm-hmm. Um, then you become friends of other professionals. And obviously that's a relatively easy point, but you see them every day. So outside of the four walls, when I'm not with some of my best friends, like I've still got some of the guys I play with are my best friends. Some of my past teammates are also some of my best friends. But in terms of the people you grow up with, you separate from them so quickly because your life's going a completely different way. 19, Max Gorn being 19 high school friend I grew up with, we're doing completely different things. I'm drinking 10 times for the year maybe after a couple of games and maybe a few times in the off season they're going 10 times in a week. Like mm. it's, it's a completely different life. So you do have to go fair loan. And, and, and that's why I love, I love my family and I love now bringing up a, a son because um, I feel like I'm ready for that and I've got a great opportunity, but that's so more advanced than the people I grew up with again. Um, it's like the people in country towns who have mm. kids, they've got families of four by 23. Yes. Um, so, and Jess is from a country town, so maybe that's why we've gone early. Um, Ballarat, Ballarat West she's from she doesn't like saying that apparently, God, it's, a bad, God, apparently God. it's a bad part of Ballarat oh we, can we verify <laughs> does Ballarat West come up on the uh, news Wunder, Wunderee Wunderee <laughs> yeah oh um, Wunderee yeah okay uh, so I wouldn't class myself as a loner um, but certainly uh, if I had a choice to go to a 30th or get prepared for a game I'd probably be preparing for a game mm. so I make I make calls that would make myself a loner a lot more. And I love being at home. My way of detoxing is to be home for four days and stay on the couch. And, and like happy with your own company Correct. or that of your immediate family Correct. as well? Mm, yep. Um, I want to... Oh, actually, this is something like I, I, I really like about you. Like a couple of things. A, the fact that you're, you're a big cereal guy <laughs> and you would eat cereal 24-7 if you could. Yep. Um, what was it? And you, with what you like now, is that what you had like as a kid? You know, growing up, was there always something that you... I've just recently gone back to the cereal that I had every day in high school, um, which is really exciting that I've gone back to that. Yeah, and I can see that now. Like you're yeah. actually legit pumped. I was on a healthy cereal for a little bit, um, sort of just trying to control my weight and mm. as a professional athlete, you should yeah. be. And not saying this isn't healthy. It's got muesli in its name, so it must be some sort of you know, Are you going to not name it? Here no, muesli the... flakes. It's in part of the Uncle Toby's Plus range. <laughs> okay. um, you know, they have like six different colored boxes and they're all sort of muesli-based flakes, yes. uh, like cereals. Um, but it's toasted muesli and it's mm. most likely got as much sugar as Cocoa Pops. But yeah. um, that's what I've gone back to and I'm really enjoying it. Then I've got the one that I think is my treat, which is a thing called Crispix. Mm. Um, which are basically honey flavored corn flakes in a way. What well, corn flakes are almost honey flavored. Mm. No, no, that's crunchy nut. In between crunchy nut and corn flakes, and they're shaped like a little checkered. Uh, 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 what's the, the shape called? Lattice. No, yeah, yeah, I know, you know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then my healthy cereal is a thing called Wheaties, which I add sultanas to, which ruins the healthiness because sultanas is. Are they no lot, good for you? There's just a whole lot of dried fruit, like it's sugar. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love my cereal, and I, I I get tattoos on my left shin, uh, and that'll be the only place I get them. Uh, apart from I do have a wedding ring, and I have a wine glass randomly on my wrist, but yep. they'll all go there, and it's all things I sort of like. 
Um, so a box of cereal will be making its way there at some the point. Detail, like, like hypothetically, could it be a Crispix cereal? I'm not sure if it'll be in colour, but detail. Yeah, and a box or like a bowl? Box. Box. Yeah, and peanut butter is another thing that might make its way there. Do you eat it like straight out of the... The day the I learned I could have peanut butter more than just a spread on toast was the day that changed my life. Yeah. Like... You get grown up knowing that you have peanut butter on toast. And then at some like, point yeah. in your life, you work out, you can have it in smoothies, you can eat it out of the tub, you can dip a carrot in there. Like it's <laughs> at some point in your life, you just work out peanut butter is and you can have it at any time of the day. And it's the best moment. I, I wish I liked peanut butter, but I just don't. Oh, really? Like it's, yeah. I think I had a bad All experience. the other spreads, I'm still at their spreads. So jam, honey, I'm still like they're made for spreads. Yes. The peanut butter has gone to a whole new level. Yep, and well, that's honey for some people. Some people have honey with everything, yep. coffee. Um, yeah, I think that's the only... Oh, Nutella is maybe branching out, but it's the same. So I suppose same premise, yep. isn't it? Like Vegemite's branched out a little bit, stayed safe, but yeah, I, I wish I did because I feel like I'm missing out on something. And Everyone there's just, so like, many different brands of peanut butter now. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. The peanut butter world has just gone from... The, good on them. The, the, that sort of stuff, like the little foods that start from like when you're a kid, it's like what you have like in the house. Mm. And we... We were we were pretty lucky. Like occasionally, there was like a can of Diet Coke, yep. you know, which now I realise is almost worse for you than normal Coke. Yep. Uh, and the we, it was always just wheat bix for us. So wheat bix, maybe a bit of bit of sugar on there, or a bit of a bit of honey bananas. But the one that blew my mind was corn pops, like Kellogg's corn pops, and that was like drugs. Yep. You know, as you know, just like that sugar hit, and I was like, it's amazing. You realise yeah. what well, you can't have yeah. it like all the time. Fruit Loops. Same, oh. same sort of situation. Mm, yeah. Fruit Loops is seen as like, if you give your kid Fruit Loops, you might as well get Just, in ecstasy. Yep. Yeah, there's pouring, pouring sugar yep. in there and stuff. Yeah. No, I'm, it's yeah. funny cereals. It's just the marketing around like neutral grain is seen as you'll be the fittest person in Australia if mm. you have a bowl of neutral grain every morning. Yep. It's funny the marketing and how it's allowed. Milo, yep. but Milo's chocolate sugar. Oh, it's phenomenal that that's seen as like a... As a but geez, it's good, isn't it? Well, that's we, another thing. When you realise you can have Milo on a, on numerous oh, amount of things as well. That's a fun day. Remember when they changed it and it went from the granular stuff to like literally like sand, like powder? <laughs> yeah, no good. No but good. then straight out of the tin or if you had an all milk Milo growing up. Yep. Because some of some people would make them with water. It's Sorry, like, one more time. People make it with water. They put like a bit of Milo in the bottom boiling water to halfway and then fill the rest of, like, with I milk. don't think that's a common thing. I was just having people make bad Milo's yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got to have some words with some people like, you know, growing up. But then the other things I want to share, like I love planes. Um, I'm a big fan of yeah. planes, which is a, a, I could sit. Where, did, where does that come from? Always been a thing? Yeah, I'm just amazed by planes. I'm not amazed in them. <laughs> like I don't, I don't mind traveling, like, but the whole I'm tall, I don't really fit in mm. planes. I'm not really amazed in them, but I'm amazed watching them. Mm. Um, air traffic control would be right up there as my peak job. Like if I got, if I landed that, I don't know how well they pay or what their hours are could, like. But could if I that get be it, something you would go into? Or would be I looked at it like, and yeah. it looks like there's some study. Like I can't just roll, <laughs> roll down to LAX Doing and go. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this plane can land here. This one wait up there for a bit. It looks like yeah. there's a bit of study to do. I'm not that interested in being a pilot either. Driving it doesn't mm. really like. I just, I, I just, just I just want to sit. Yeah. And telemarine doesn't excite me that much because it's a plane that lands every ten minutes where. Mm. You got to Moorabbin Airport, which is one of the busiest airports going around. They're not big planes, but they land every minute. Uh, I went and uh, LAX was one of the more fun things I've done because mm. they are four runways taken off landing every second. Um, you sit there and just watch them come in, those big Boeings. So I've got one of them. I've got a bike. I love cycling. Um, is that your ruck leg or your one you nah, the shin guard. Or? the shin guard goes right, on the okay. right. Okay, you want to keep the, the canvas good for yeah, the, yeah. the other one? Yeah. Uh, and it's not a shin guard, it's a bit of padding. I've been a big non shin guard man. I feel like you've you're changing that. I've seen a lot I was at the game on Thursday. Every, Everyone's for doing years, it. it was socks up, two shin guards. And now all of a sudden people just tape shin guards, no socks up. And I felt like people thought I started it, but I don't wear a shin guard. I just wore a tiny Never have. little bit of padding. Mm. Because I'd hurt my PCL not wearing a shin guard. So now I have to because my PCL will literally fall off if I don't get some sort of protection at some right. point. But if I had the choice, I'd go back to no shin guard. Because um, I hated the way, because that's my two knee Rico leg. Mm. And I hated having something else on it. Like I just, I felt like shin guard weighed 100 grams. I felt like I weighed 10 kilos. Just I'm like, psychologically, I just don't want yeah. that on my leg. 
Um, I've slowly get accustomed to like physios and doctors that convince me to get now a tiny bit of padding. So I have a little bit of padding. Okay. Well, I think you're, you're influencing the whole league now because that's all I see now. No one socks up. Grundy's like... socks up. I one sock up, but he covers his shin guard. Um, I think Nick Nat's both socks up, but there's not many. Do you... Goldstein's both socks. Are the socks now um, Dangerfield? Socks up? Not a Ruckman though, granted. No, I kind of like people going back to socks up. I don't think we we have one. But do your socks long enough now? No, we don't don't have long socks. I saw everyone wearing the the short ones. We're different like that. We can request long socks. Um, But yeah, our socks are all quite small base, almost like these ones I got on. You're, You're lucky... Because I remember when the short, like I used to be, I went through a phase of like socks up and I got skinny legs, but yeah. if they got the hoops, it makes them look wider. Yeah. Like that's an optical illusion, I was told. Well, um, hoops as a jumper is yes. historically, if you're out of shape, doesn't look great. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So it's not uh, not flattering. And then towards the end of my playing days, all the guys, like, they were cutting their own socks. Yeah. And then I made the mistake, oh, I'll cut them myself. And then I cut on the wrong color. Mm-hmm. They say you always cut. We had black and gold. So I always cut on the black and I cut on the yellow. And yeah, me mate, Jimmy Lorena, never let me live it down. He goes, mate, he goes, I'll just Jimmy. give you a quiet word. He was our captain. He goes, give you a quiet word. You just you cut on the black. So you might Jimmy. need to order some some freshies. Um, what I wanted to, I'm curious, and we've done a bit of back and forth. Like, you're a bit of a, a, a quiz fiend. Yeah. You, uh, you like to sort of, you know, on a day like switch off and, you know, Millionaire Hot Seat, you know, comes on. Millionaire and- Hot Seat. Um this is quite funny. This, during COVID, Jess and I managed to cook dinner without even knowing. Like, it didn't get to 5.30 and we go, oh, we should organize dinner. One, one of us would just get up, start doing the veggies. The other one would get up, maybe start doing the meat or if we're doing something else. It would be ready by the million dollar question every night. We'd have it ready at 5.57 every night. It was phenomenal. It was like getting something to be freaky that we had dinner ready at 5.57. But we'd cook dinner or prepare dinner or eat dinner while watching Hot Seat. And there was numerous amount of times where I could have gone the whole way. I reckon we got, they got to do like a celebrity version one time and uh, and get you on there. But bring- then there's heaps of times where I get nine out of the ten wrong. Yeah. So like I think I've just the day I go to Millionaire Hot Seat. If It'll I be go, that day. it could be the day where I had ten questions that I know and they didn't go talk about King William the Third, what he had for breakfast on <laughs> World War. Like if they stay away from something I don't know, just stay in my lane. Maybe there's a chance I could win a million dollars. I miss the old trivia shows. Like, did you ever watch Sale of the Century? Yeah, and I want Millionaire to go back to who wants to be a millionaire. He gets yeah. a 32,000 as a safe point. You got three lifelines. Like, I'll mm. phone a friend and the friend doesn't know. Like, they're, they're great. You want it. Like, Slumdog Millionaire watching that mm. movie. You want it. Now it's hot seat and it's a raffle. And I get someone win Sonic every night. But Did you ever get around like pub trivia much? Uh, we had a team for a little bit. Uh, my, 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 my massive strength is sport. I love sport. Yeah. I'm a sport nuffy. And then geography is my second strength. Um, but then outside of that, that's why teams are great. Win a little $100 pub voucher or something. Mm. Um, yeah, good fun. Once I got into a taxi when I was living in Toronto mm. and the guy, he just like turned around and he said, he goes, hello, sir. He goes, if you, if you would like, you know, I can, you can get a free ride. You just need to give me one correct answer. He goes, I'll drive you anywhere you want to go <laughs> in, in Toronto. And I was like, okay. And he goes, where are you from? And Is that the question? No, that, that, wasn't, it wasn't, that wasn't the question. <laughs> be a good yeah. free ride. He goes, where are you from, Australia? He goes, okay. Like, um, he goes, I can... And he w- he asked me, like, what's the... And I'm, I'm going to get this one. Like, the second biggest island off Australia. I, 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 no, I can't quite uh, that's remember. Ast- that's that, Australian? Australian, yeah. So the, the I second know, biggest. I don't know if the, the scab man can can get on that. Second biggest Australian island. Yeah. So are we classifying that as like, I know Phillip Island's not the answer, but is Phillip Island part of that, or is like? I, I would imagine so. Yeah, like so obviously like Tassie it is would, the is the first biggest island. And then it'd be Australia. I'm guessing some of the islands off Tassie, kangaroo or French. <laughs> You know the answer. You've looked it up. I, 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 I said it's, Melville Island. And is that one of the ones off Tassie? Maybe. No, I think that's north. Oh, is it? it is, uh, Up the top near Darwin and Cairns. Yeah, you know right. what? There you I go. actually think I'm making things up. I think I got it wrong because no, because I, I remember I got it wrong and I had to pay for the taxi. Yeah. And 
that it turns out this guy was a like a savant with uh, geography. So he knew his geography. World. Oh, yeah. And he knows that he could ask a question that no one's going to yep. get and stuff. You know, and well, would it be Tassie? Tassie's not classified anymore, surely. As an island? Yeah. It still is. Is it Tassie? Yeah. Okay, I thought you looked at me like then it was like a trick question. You know, yeah, that's why in. I sort of said mm. it wouldn't be Tassie. And anyway, this guy... Well, like, Australia. Goes, oh, <laughs> and he asked, I think I got that one wrong. And then he goes, What's the second biggest mountain in Western Australia? He goes, Where are you from in Australia? He could like localize and ask me a question about where I grew up. Yeah. You know? And turns out he's like this savant. And I don't know why he was driving a cab, maybe. He, I think, and I asked him, but he showed me this laminated um, bit of paper where he wrote to um, whoever makes atlases. What's the company that makes atlases? Yeah, someone like that. He wrote to them and said, oh, by the way, your map's wrong. I thought it was one of those ones that it's called an atlas because that's the company that started it. Like, that's, that's it, the... it could be. Yeah. I, and he, he got a response back and that's what he let me go. Oh, yes, thanks very much, sir. You're correct. We'll update this in our next thing. Like, he pointed out the errors in the atlas and then he played a, I think it was a CD at the time, where he could list every single country on the planet mm. in under two minutes or something. Um, well, I mean, British cabbies know every street without a, a Melways. Like, they know everywhere around Britain. I get, but I'm just like, geography would be a strong point of a cabbie, but to know where you're from in Australia is yeah. phenomenal. And like I said to him, mate, why, why are you driving a cab when you potentially could be doing, and it's, I want to say no shade on people mm. who drive cabs as a, as a career. You could be it. entering in every single who wants to be moving there in every country and just hoping you can get yeah. on one show. And he goes, I just, he goes, I love people. He goes, it's a way for me to meet people. I get to engage and that sort of thing. And it was one of the most honest, like pure moments, like out of nowhere um, that I'd ever come across. But still, you know, 25 bucks plus tip. You know, <laughs> you know, yeah. We got it wrong. <laughs> in a cab. Yeah. <laughs> one thing I ask every guest who comes yep. on the show, uh, and I'm very curious uh, about it. We're is, not going to stop now. No. Nope. What, are, what are your core values? Uh, usually that's one of the ones you give up, you give a little head to head, heads up, but we've talked about it so much mm. um, that they do sit pretty forefront in my mind. Um, they're all, once again, based off what my mum and dad had, and I'm presuming majority of people's values are parents and family traditions. and um, So I've got a big, strongest sense of belonging. Um, I'm performing best when I do have that sense of belonging. Um, and that's everything from job to home to feeling like I'm providing for my family um, to feeling like I'm being a good son to mum and dad. So that sense of belonging is really important. It keeps me at a good level. Um, and then working your ass off. I've been a, a lot of, obviously, I've had to do it from where I've come from. But my parents, they flew over from New Zealand with a young three kids and both of them had no jobs and both of them had no family here. Like, what are you doing? Why do, why do you go make that decision? Looking back on it, I'm like, you idiots. Mm. You could have just been in New Zealand and like had parents there to take this. If you guys want to go out party, you had a nanny. Like, they just did it the hard way. Um, Mum started with hairdressing that she didn't have a thing for and then eventually made her way to hospitality. Dad's still studying something to get to upskill himself, but he's in earth moving and, and loving life as well. And they've both managed to get to the top of their industries. And I feel like that's been installed in, in, in both of my brothers. We, we love working hard. Um, we realize working hard is the way to get things. Um, so, and then loyalty would be the, the, the final one of the key ones. So um, working hard, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for for that? Is it, um, is it work ethic or mm. persistence or something like that? Um, and then the last one would be uh, loyal, loyalty. Um, without knowing, like I don't sit there and go, geez, loyalty is one of my biggest. But if you go through my life, I've got the same group of friends that I had from year seven. I, if, some of my best mates are past players because I, like, I can't let a past player just go and let them go on to their own merry thing. I keep in touch. Um, I, I haven't left this football club with multiple opportunities. Um, I stay in similar areas. I've, I've, apart from now, now I'm Peninsula, but I originally was a Peninsula boy. Like I'm stuck to things. Um, so loyalty definitely is reasons why I tick as well. I think sometimes the 
the, our core values don't always like present themselves straight if you like to list them down but like should you go back and look over your life there's the, the subconscious ones that just show up and like clearly is something to, important to you but you don't it's like automatic you don't need to reaffirm every day like oh you yeah. know loyalty that oh, sort of i'd thing. love it's just, it's like, if i got to choose my values i don't think a sense of belonging would be in there because i i would love to be someone that can be creative and work at their best while they're going through change and adapting and stuff like that but i feel like i need to feel like i'm at home um so yeah you don't get to pick your values um no. unfortunately i think it's just how you're growing up and your personality traits and your family traits and it all sort of mixes in and you go yeah that that is how i tick you don't get to pick your core values, but you do get to pick to come on this show. And I'm very grateful that you have. Um, glad we could finally make it happen. And I appreciate your time as well as just coming and being open, honest and, uh, and vulnerable. So, Maxie, thanks very much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Dust. We'll see you next time.